Well, let's, um, <clears throat> let's begin by reading uh, the passage that we're looking at this morning, as well as the one we're looking at this evening, because they are, they are connected. Uh, Romans chapter 15, verses 14 through 16. And um, uh, let me just remind you, we're going to be focusing mainly on verse 14 this morning. So Paul writes <clears throat> to the church at Rome, he says, And concerning you, my brethren... I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. But I have written very boldly to you on some points, so as to remind you again, because of the grace that was given me from God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Well, again, the, uh, I'll, I think I'll elaborate a little bit more on the connection between these verses, but I think uh, you can at least see here initially uh, that Paul is telling us, uh, telling the Roman believers anyway, that they are able to admonish, and because they are able, the presumption is that they should, and we're going to see that in other parts of Scripture as well. So, the importance of admonishment, and I know admonishment kind of sounds like a foreboding kind of a word, you know, we think of it in terms of warning, but we do need to see it as something that is good and something that, uh, when done correctly, can, can be a great blessing uh, to each other. Now, just a reminder again, last week uh, Paul was, was telling us that God is a God of hope. Uh, no, matter how dark things, uh, no matter how dark things ever became in the world, God always held out hope. He always made certain promises. And again, remember when Adam and Eve fell, He promised the seed of the woman who would destroy the work of the devil who had destroyed them. When He threatened the flood... He told Noah to build the ark, and he promised him and his household deliverance from that judgment. When he destroyed Egypt, uh, as he was pronouncing the fact that he was going to bring the ten plagues, he, he promised he would protect his people from that judgment, and he also promised that through this redemption he would bring them into the promised land. When he exiled Judah, you know, when he brought Nebuchadnezzar against them, he promised that he would bring them back and reestablish them in the land. And, of course, perhaps the greatest promise of all, of which all these are just, just shadows and types, when the old covenant people of God could not keep the law of God, when they could not please Him, they could not honor Him, because of the old covenant, because the law was written on stone and it couldn't give them the power to keep it. God extended to them the, the promise of hope that He would make a new covenant with them that would give them that power. And we noted last week that in the new covenant, He's also held out hope to us, the Gentiles. Remember, we were strangers to the covenants. We were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. We were without God. We had no hope in the world. But through Christ, through the new covenant, we too have been brought near. Our sins are forgiven. We have heaven to look forward to, and we have the promise that God's going to work everything together for our good on the way to heaven. Now, we have this hope because we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Without trust in Christ, there is no hope. He is the source of that hope doesn't come through works, but remember that Paul also prayed that we might know that we have this hope, that God would fill us with the evidence that we have saving faith, and remember what those evidences are, love for Him, love for His Word, love for His worship, love for His people, a desire to engage in the things of the Lord joy in seeing the glory of God and being delighted in that, in, in being in this relationship with God. And of course, peace, knowing that we are safe, having trusted 
the Lord and that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. You know, it's when we see these fruits of the Spirit's work that we know God is assuring us. As Paul said, he wanted these things to be full in us so that our assurance, our hope would be a full hope, a full assurance. Now, I say that because I do think that Paul transitions into the subject we're looking at this morning based upon this assurance, this idea of hope and how it can be full because I think Paul goes on now to tell us how these evidences can be strengthened in our lives so that our assurance can be even stronger. And that is through admonition. And again, admonition, I, you know, it, it, it almost seems like it's, it's something that is to be done occasionally. As we see somebody getting out of line, you know, they need to be admonished. Well, that's not all admonishment is. Admonishment is, is much broader than that. And I think if we think of it as, again, that constant pressure that needs to be applied to us, that we each of us need to keep moving forward, that, that's how we ought to look at it, you know. And yes, it is corrective. Yes, it's, it has all these, these features, but it's something that is ongoing, something that's happening now, okay, right now as the Word of God is being explained, something that happens when we read the Bible. It's something that, that we ought to be again, doing for one another. So what I'd like us to do this morning is to consider admonishing, okay, what it means to admonish, that it is our duty to admonish, and perhaps most importantly for our subject this morning is what has to be true of us. If we're going to do this well, if we're going to do it effectively and not end up, you know, offending each other as we do it, okay. So first of all, let's consider what the word means. Now, I'm going to do something that I usually don't do. I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a Greek word this morning, okay? This word admonish comes from a Greek word, which is nuthateo, nuthateo, two Greek words, okay? Nous, maybe you've heard that before. If you listen to R.C. Sproul, some of these words should sound familiar. Nous, which means mind, and then the word tithemi, which we don't use, but it, it means to place or to put. Now think about what these two words combined into one word might possibly mean. Well, it means to place or to put in mind, okay? To remind, either by warning or by instruction. And yes, it's true, it does have a corrective element to it because we're all so prone to go the wrong direction. Admonition or, you know, reminding is meant to get us to go in the right direction. Or, you know, we're also prone to believe things that are incorrect and this is meant to get us to believe the right things. So it, it's corrective. Yes, it is corrective. If we, if we embrace an error... We need to be corrected with the truth. If, we've, if we're doing something that's sinful, which is hateful, remember that sin is hate, obedience is love, then we need it to call us again to love. Now, you know, it's interesting. I, I had practically written this entire exposition sermon before I realized in, in my title that this is actually where um, this whole, the, the whole school a whole movement in the Reformed Church actually came from. Maybe you're uh, familiar with uh, the word nuthetic counseling. That's another reason why I quoted the Greek word, nuthetao, to get the, the transliteration there. Nuthetic. J. Adams is the one who originated this method of counseling, um, although he didn't originate biblical counseling. You know, that's something that's as old as the, the time when God first corrected Adam and Eve or gave them instruction in, in the, the garden not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know, that was, that was a warning to them. And, you know, this admonition includes, includes warning. But J. Adams started a, a new movement within the counseling community. And he started it with his book, which was groundbreaking at the time, Competent to Counsel. And I didn't realize, but... Um, 
able to admonish? I mean, what's the difference, right? It's, I think this is where he got the title of his book. Okay, the fundamental concept is this, that we only experience blessing, wellness, wholeness, if we go God's way, okay? J. Adams uses God's truth rather than man's theories, okay, to correct and to counsel, to warn, to instruct, to get people going the right direction. And this applies both to the unbeliever as well as to the believer, because what is the unbeliever's problem? Well, the unbeliever's problem is they're doing mostly everything wrong, and they're not doing it to the glory of God. And the reason they can't is because they're not trusting Christ. And maybe that's because they never heard. So J. Adams' approach to the unbeliever as he comes into the counseling room for, for counsel is, well, here's your first problem. You need to be born again. You need to trust in Christ. And so he evangelizes. But for the believer, if he gets into some difficulty or she along the way, they need to be admonished. They need to be corrected. They need to be instructed because there's something they're not doing right, something they're not believing right. And if they bring it into alignment with God's Word, then they will be blessed, right? Now, this is something that he would say that doesn't happen just in a counseling office. This is something that should be happening everywhere. We should be those who are competent to counsel or able <coughs> to admonish. And that's really the second point. This is our duty. This is what the Lord calls us to do. Now, let me point out, first of all, clearly this was a part, a large part of Paul's ministry. Um, I had a professor in college who uh, you maybe heard me say this once before when he was talking about his inability to remember things. He said, I have a better forgettery than I have a memory. And I think that's true of all of us. You know, it's not just the knowledge that we forget, but we tend to forget the importance, too, of the knowledge we have. You know, it comes to mind that, that sometimes that knowledge is very powerful. It moves us in the right direction. Other times we remember it, but it seems to have no effect on us. Well, there's a couple of things we need to remember, not only the knowledge itself, but, but also how we ought to love those things and how we ought to be moved by these things. Well, Paul understood those things. He knew that we were prone to forget. He knew that we were prone not to put the weight on these truths that we ought to. And so he would remind. You know, I read to you verses 15 and 16 in, in the book of Romans. Um, what Paul is saying there is this, that he wrote the letter to the Romans for this very purpose, to admonish them. He says, I, I know you're able to do it. But I have still written boldly on these parts because I have a particular, you know, purpose in mind, which is the same purpose. I want you to be sanctified. So he wrote to remind them of the gospel, and he wrote to remind them what the gospel calls them, how it calls them to live. So he reminded them of right thinking and of right living, and he said, hold these things fast. You know, in the book of Acts, we read in Acts 20, verse 31, that he called the Ephesian elders to himself after he had spent many years with them, and then he went across um, the, the sea and uh, was concerned that they might forget already what it is he said. And, and we're talking about the Ephesian elders. He said this, Be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Paul was admonishing them for three years. Again, and when he brings them over, the first thing he does is admonishes them again to remember, remember these things. He wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 4.14, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. Have you read 1 Corinthians lately? Okay, the, the church was full of division. They had, they had knowledge, they had gifts, they had so many blessings, but they were so divided, and Paul was seeking to correct them and to warn them and to advise them and to get them again to become one body in Christ, to become unified. Now, in doing this, Paul was simply following the examples that he had from the Old Testament scriptures. I mean, 
We read in Psalm 81 verse 8 that God admonishes people, listen to me and I will admonish you. Well, He often did that for His people, through His Holy Spirit, by the prophets. You know, and, and Nehemiah tells us that. We'll look at that a little bit more this evening. God would constantly admonish His people, remind them of what it is He called them to do and why, why they need to do it. So it'll be well with you, okay? Nehemiah admonished God's people when he saw them working and buying and selling on God's holy day. He admonished them not to desecrate the Sabbath. Don't you remember that this is the reason why our fathers went into captivity? Eliphaz, if you've read the book of Job recently, uh, commended Job. I think it may have been a false commendation as he, he's sort of setting him up to criticize him. But he says, uh, he admonished him, I should say, for, uh, or I should say he commended him for admonishing many because it strengthened them. It strengthened their resolve to do the right thing. And then if you've read Jeremiah recently, we didn't read Lamentations, but um, maybe some of you did. But in Lamentations, Jeremiah is he's looking at the situation that Judah is in and how they had listened to so many of the false prophets and they believed them and were going the wrong direction. And he's thinking, what can I say? What can I say to admonish them? What can I do to get them to turn around so that they can again experience God's blessing? Well, again, admonishment is very, very important. Paul implies in our passage that we are also to admonish each other. Now, he implies that. He says, you're able to do it. Why does he say that? Well, it's because he wants them to do it. That, that's our obligation. But he explicitly tells us that that is our obligation in his letters to the Thessalonians. He says in Thec 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter... Take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Yet, do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. In this case, corrective admonishment. Get him to turn around. Don't, don't just treat him as though everything's okay, you know, and, and just brush it off, but admonish him. Okay, don't just shun him, but, but deal with him. And we'll see exactly how in just a moment. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, where he says, I urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Now, I think what Paul is telling us here is that our Lord wants us to be on the alert. He wants us to be looking and listening and seeing what each other is doing. And look out for each other, care about each other. We need to be paying attention to what, you know, we hear each other saying. What do you believe? And to what each other is doing, you know. Um, and again, we're, we're going to focus on that a little bit more this evening. But the point is, it, it doesn't take long for someone to just fall away. Okay, especially in today's world, in our society, with its ungodly and perverse thinking. It, it's geared to take us away from the Lord. So unless we're looking at the truth, you know, and walking in the truth, we're not going to be safeguarded against this. Well, God has given to us two ways to prevent this from happening. Prayer, okay? Prayer is one of them, and that's why it's a good thing that we're finding ways to be more involved in praying for one another. But the other is admonition, okay? Reminding, correcting, encouraging to keep moving forward. Okay, so we know what admonition is. We, we know that it's a very important part of, of Paul's ministry and of God's ministry through his prophets. And uh, it's, it's also something that we're to be involved in. But finally, I want us to consider this, that Paul tells us that there are <clears throat> qualifications. I mean, anybody can do it, but the question is, do it effectively. Not everybody can do it effectively. Some people can irritate or enrage. Others 
can actually do this in an effective way. And, and there's a reason. And the reason is in what Paul says are the qualifications. So let me read verse 14 again. And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. I would suggest to you that those first two things he says there, full of goodness, full of knowledge, are those qualifications. Now, to be full of goodness means two things. It means, first of all, that, that we need to be doing the right things. We need to be morally upright. Paul wrote in our <clears throat> meditation, Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. By the way, that's humility. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Now, Paul says, you who are spiritual, do this, restore, okay? To be spiritual means to be filled with the Spirit. It means to be molded by the Spirit, conformed to the Spirit. And, and what is the Spirit doing in our lives? But He's working to make us like Christ, okay? Jesus, as we know, was, was very... Um, Gentle, blessed are the, are the gentle, you know, uh, and he exhibited those particular characteristics. And obviously he was morally upright. You know, he was one who did the right thing and so could correct. So one thing I want us to note here is that um, in order for this to happen, it does take time. It does take a certain level of maturity. You who are spiritual... It, it won't work for us to try to admonish somebody, to correct somebody, to encourage somebody if we need correction and encouragement in exactly the same area, right? Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. By the way, Jesus said this, okay? We need to deal with our own faults first, you know, before we try to correct somebody else. We need to be spiritual, which has included in it an element of, of uh, maturity. But we also need love. We, we need to be able to do this in a spirit of gentleness. We need to care about the people that we're seeking to become involved with, right? The Spirit also is the one who works this virtue in our hearts, remembering that the new covenant blessing is His writing the law in our hearts, giving us really the power to keep the greatest and the second greatest commandment, to love God with our whole being and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Now, I'd, I'd love to be able to tell you, though I think we all know it isn't true, that as soon as you trust in Jesus, you can do these things perfectly, but we know that isn't the case. It takes time, okay? It takes time for the Spirit to work these graces in our souls. And let me just suggest that we're not going to be able to deal gently with someone until the Spirit of God works this grace in our souls. Now, this is very, very important because I think the tendency with most people, when you try to correct them or try to encourage them or try to do anything that suggests that maybe they're doing something wrong. Okay. All right. But again, what is the first tendency in ourselves when somebody suggests that we're doing the wrong thing? or believing the wrong thing, or, you know, something's out of sorts. Well, we tend to get angry. We tend to retaliate. Well, what about you? You know, what, what about this you're doing, you know, and, and so forth? Well, nobody likes to be told they're doing the wrong thing. But that's why gentleness is very important. But let me just say this as an aside. Uh, we should 
actually like it when people point out things that we really are doing that are wrong. That's something that, that we should receive, something we should invite. Why do I say that? Well, think about what David said in Psalm 141, verse 5. Let the righteous smite me in kindness and reprove me. It is oil upon the head. Do not let my head refuse it. And I think he was either praying to God for that or perhaps suggesting to himself that he would not refuse correction. Now, notice, first of all, he said, let the righteous do this to me. You know, the, well, those that are truly gracious, not the wicked, and not somebody who's nominal, but somebody who's devoted to the Lord who really cares about me and, and knows God's will. Let them do it in kindness, notice, not, not just you know, braid me and scourge me, but to do it in kindness and a spirit of gentleness, because he says it's like oil on the head. Here's that image again, you know, oil on the head. They liked this. This was a good thing for them. And remember the idea of oil on the high priest's head. It's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It, it's certainly, why? Because it's, it's a symbol of refreshment and comfort and blessing. Uh, and it apparently brought blessing to them, you know, to have this done. But David was saying, this, this is like, the ministry of the Spirit of God in my life. This is His reproof. I need it, especially if it comes from the Word of God. And so he, rep he prays, Lord, don't let me refuse it. When you, when you bring this, let me listen to the one who's trying to correct me. And, and if I'm out of, out of your will, if I'm doing something that's wrong, give me the grace to receive it as something that is good. But again, I just want to remind you, it's very important for the person bringing the correction that they do it in gentleness because, again, David says, that I want this, but let those who come to me be, let the righteous do it and let them do it in kindness. Okay. But then, as I've said, we need to be full of goodness, but we also need to um, be filled with knowledge. If we're going to bring correction, it has to be the Lord's correction. It can't be a matter of opinion. Okay, we need to be filled with knowledge. We need to know what God says. We need to know what the truth is so that we can recognize that which is truly an error, know whether it's serious enough actually to deal with. And this is something, again, that only comes with time, isn't it? Time in the Word, time in study time with the Spirit's illuminating work in our lives, um, in, in applying it to ourselves. I mean, by our applying it to ourselves, we learn more. I don't know if I ever shared this with you, but something John Frame often said in class was, application is, is understanding. The more you can apply something, the better you understand that passage. So if you work on application, your understanding of Scripture will, will greatly increase, and that will not only help you and help me, but it, we can help others because our understanding of the Scriptures will become fuller. Okay, we, we have to see the problem unless we can see it, okay, in doctrine or morals, and unless we can know also that it's something that needs to be dealt with. Because we're not, I don't think, you know, what we're saying here is this. We're not saying that if you don't agree with me in everything I believe, that I'm going to correct you because you're wrong and I'm right. We know the good Christians differ in, in many different areas, and they can still be true believers, right? But um, there are those errors that are much more serious and need to be addressed. So we need to see the problem. We need to know whether it's a problem that needs to be dealt with. There are also matters of Christian liberty. Let's not forget about those as well, and I think Paul probably had those in mind. Once we recognize it, unless we're able to come in a spirit of gentleness and a spirit of love and concern, I'm suggesting that we don't really even attempt it or we can make matters worse. I don't think everybody automatically has the ability to do this just because we're a believer. Okay? I think we need a certain level of maturity. Now, Paul was convinced that the Roman believers had reached that point 
And since they had, that's something they should do because the church needs it. Now, this evening, we're going to see that though it was true that the Roman believers could do this for each other, Paul also believed that he needed to do it as well. He needed to admonish them. That's why he wrote the book of Romans. And the ultimate goal was so that his offering of the Gentiles would be sanctified, acceptable to God. And I think he's referring there to personal sanctification, that they would be not just a holy people in the holiness of Christ, so that is very, very important. Without it, you'll never see heaven. But that the evidences of that would be in their lives. That's the goal of the admonition, is that we might become more like Him. So admonishing, which is reminding each other of God's truth, is our duty. It's what God calls us to do. But to do it, we do need to be filled with love and knowledge if we're going to do it well. Well, one way that we can be filled with, with love is um, what we've just been doing. We've just been admonished to be filled with love, so we need to be seeking the Lord. But another way is coming to the table. And as we approach the table this morning, let's, let's do a couple of things. Let's look to the Lord for that communion with Christ, that communion with His Spirit, that filling of the Spirit that, that fills us with love. And in that love, let's purpose to love God by continuing to study His Word so that we would be competent to counsel. You see, that's the, that was the whole thrust of that book, Competent Counsel. By the way, I'd recommend that book to you if you haven't read it. It's a very, very good book. But it, it equips you to be able to do this for other people. And the fact that Jay Adams wrote it, he wasn't writing just to Christian counselors, although he was, but he was writing to all of God's people because we are all to be competent to counsel. That's what our Lord calls us to do. So let's, uh, let's take just a moment, shall we, and bow in silent prayer, and let's, as we prepare to, to come to the table, let's pray that God would give us that key element that we need to move in that direction, which is the love of His Spirit, the desire to love and honor and glorify Him in this way.